Yes, I'm the guy who seasons his X instead of his Y. But it's not just me. The traditional Italian way of making dried noodles is about two parts semolina flour, one part water, knead, shape, and dry. That's it. No salt in the dough. Instead, you salt the boil water. The pasta absorbs the salt and the water as it cooks, and at the end you have perfectly seasoned pasta. Why not cut out the middleman? Why not just put salt directly into the dough? Well, I have been researching that question for some time, and I have found no clear answer among the experts. I do have a theory. My thesis is pasta without salt is easier to make, especially when you're doing it the old school way by hand, i.e. the way that the people who invented this style would have done it. I'll show you an experiment I did, the results of which I think support my thesis, but I don't think the evidence is conclusive. Plus, I'm just a guy in his kitchen with a camera. In contrast, this is Dr. Frank Manthe at North Dakota State University. He's the guy Taylor and Francis went to to co-write the pasta chapters in the Handbook of Food Science, Technology, and Engineering. This is one of those books they sell for nearly $2,000 because basically the only people who want it are pasta manufacturers, and that's a very small market of book buyers. My point is, Dr. Manthe is one of the top people in this country whom the pasta industry consults when they need scholarly expertise. And I asked him, why don't you put salt into the pasta dough? Well, because you don't have to. That's it? Well, I mean, noodle products, they have salt. He's talking there about like Asian style noodles. Udon, for example. Noodle styles that generally have at least a little salt or sodium bicarb in the dough. And there's not much difference between noodles and pasta. Uh, I mean, adding salt affects the drying properties, the rate of drying, or ease of drying. As we can see in this 2014 paper from Chinese and Japanese scientists, salt in the dough slows the rate of drying, which is kind of counterintuitive, and there are many things going on there chemically, but one obvious thing is that salt is hygroscopic. It absorbs water and holds onto it, which is gonna slow drying. So yeah, from like an industrial standpoint, you might leave the salt out of the dough because then you can dry your product faster and time is money. But Dr. Manthe says he doesn't think that's really the reason why there's no salt in pasta dough. The key thing about quality is that the customer gets what they expect. And you don't need to add salt to get what you expect when you eat a bowl full of spaghetti. Yep, Dr. Manthe thinks it's as simple as that. Pasta manufacturers don't put salt into the dough, for dried pasta at least, because they never have because that's just the way it is, and it's what people expect when they buy it. Customers know there isn't any salt in here, so they know to throw a lot of salt into the water. If the pasta suddenly had salt in it one day, people would end up over-seasoning their pasta and probably end up blaming the manufacturer. But all traditional practices have origins, right? Even if those origins are lost in the mists of time, we can try to infer them. And here's another thing Dr. Manthe mentioned. Salt helps toughen, strengthen the dough. Right, and that sounds like a good thing. It is a good thing. In bread making, for example, this is bread dough. But let's think about this from the perspective of the first Italian pasta makers. My hypothesis is that people mixing pasta dough in the olden days, by hand, the hard way, they would have noticed that a salted dough is considerably more time-consuming and harder to bring together. Experiment. 400 grams of semolina flour. We'll talk another day about why that is the classic pasta flour. In goes 200 grams of cool tap water. Two to one is the classic dry to wet ratio for pasta. People deviate from that in all kinds of ways, but generally pasta is a very low hydration dough compared to bread. It's a very dry dough, and dry doughs take more physical force to knead, which I think supports my hypothesis that this is all about ease of kneading. Anyway, I'm bringing this together in my stand mixer purely to standardize the experiment. I'm using the number two setting and only the number two setting today. After about four minutes, the dough comes together into a ball and then the paddle attachment starts to struggle with it and I'll have to stop and switch over to the kneading hook. Here's the exact same experiment, but with a teaspoon of coarse salt in there. This one took five minutes before the dough came together and the paddle attachment started to struggle. 
Part of that delay might simply have been the salt occupying some of the water. Some of the water is dissolving salt instead of hydrating flour particles. There's less water available to bring the flour together. So this initial mixing phase takes a little longer, like 20% longer. Not a big deal, though maybe I would feel that 20% in my forearms if I was doing this the old-fashioned way by hand. Plus, we're not done yet. We still have to actually knead the dough. And I think the salted dough is going to take longer to knead. Why? Because of how salt alters or denatures the native proteins in the wheat. Which are not to be confused with Native Deodorant, the sponsor of this video. I already knew that native makes the most delicious scents in the deodorant game. Eucalyptus and mint smells like a cocktail I'd like to have, and citrus and herbal musk smells like the guy I would like to be. And I guess I am him when I wear this stuff, but the plot thickens with the new packaging. Check it. 100% plastic free, made with 90% post-consumer recycled paper. Native is a partner of 1% for the planet, committing 1% of plastic free deodorant sales to environmental nonprofits. Buying Native is a great way to support those orgs while at the same time reducing your consumption of single-use plastics. Native deodorants are aluminum-free and paraben-free, vegan and cruelty-free. I don't see anything concerning at all on the ingredients. It's not sticky at all and it dries real quick on your skin. Normally three plastic-free deodorants would be $39, but if you use my link and code in the description, you'll get them for $26. That's more than 33% off. My code, Ragusia2, will also get you 20% off any body wash or toothpaste. Link is in the description. Use code RAGUSIA2. Thank you, native. So anyway, using the number two setting and the paddle attachment on the mixer, it took four minutes for the no salt dough to come together into a ball. It took five minutes for the salted dough to come together into a ball. Now let's switch on over to the hook, the dough hook, and actually get to kneading and see what happens. And just to be charitable, I'm going to restart the clock for this actual kneading phase with the dough hook. Salted dough is on the right. Here we are after two minutes of proper kneading, and let's test the dough for extensibility. That's probably the main thing we look for in gluten development, right? The ability to stretch without tearing. Both doughs are still quite brittle. Let's knead them again for another two minutes. Boy, the salted dough on the right is visibly different, right? It's way more crumbly, even after that extra minute of initial mixing that it had. We're at four minutes total kneading with the dough hook. Let's test again. Both are still pretty brittle, but we're getting a little more stretch on the no salt dough on the left. Give it another two minutes. Six minutes of total kneading now. No salt dough on the left looks almost ready to me. After eight total minutes with the dough hook on the number two mixer setting, I think the no salt dough is done. That's extensible enough that it'll be ready to roll out after a 20 or 30 minute rest. It took me six more minutes to get the salted dough to a point that I was happy with. And that's on top of the additional minute of initial mixing that it required. The no salt dough required two thirds of the kneading time that the salted dough required. And that's a difference that you absolutely would feel in your forearms if you were doing this by hand. Now granted, this is not a laboratory experiment that I did here, but generally you only need laboratory precision to notice very, very small differences that would not be immediately apparent to a normal person. This is a big difference that was immediately apparent to me, a normal person, in my kitchen. And I'm pretty sure it's something that people would have noticed when they were doing this themselves the old-fashioned way back in the olden days. So why, right? Why does it take longer to knead pasta dough when it has salt in it? Well, let's go back to the excellent book Bread Science by Dr. Emily Bueller, linked in the description. The wheat proteins glutenin and gliadin in their native state are folded up on themselves in little balls and segregated from each other in individual flour particles. When we introduce water, we activate protease enzymes that snip the proteins into pieces and open them up, and the water allows everything to move around and get scrambled up with the starch and the fat and the other stuff in the dough, water and protein bits bond with each other and create this solid, stretchy web called gluten. And that web traps everything else. That's a developed dough ready for shaping. By themselves, the gluten proteins have a net positive charge, which makes them inclined to repel themselves and each other. The result is a weak, loose gluten web. When you introduce salt, the sodium and chloride ions dissolve and negatively charged ions link up with the positive charges on the proteins and neutral that repelling force, thus causing the gluten to tighten up. You get a stronger web. 
Now, when your dough is finished, all mixed up and kneaded, you want the gluten to be strong. Strength is what's going to allow you to roll it out really, really thin into spaghetti, for example, without it tearing. But in the early stages, the very beginning of mixing, when the gluten proteins are still bound together in these little balls and they're stuck inside individual little flour particles, at that stage, you want them to loosen up and relax and open up so that they can envelop all of the other stuff that's in that dough and bring it together into one coherent food matrix, they would call it. The initial delay in gluten development caused by salt does not matter so much when you're making bread because bread doughs generally have a lot more water than pasta doughs and more water makes it easier to get a dough going. If anything, high hydration bread doughs without salt tend to be too sticky and messy to work with. And even then, you will see lots of bread recipes that call for some initial autolyze or pre-ferment step that leaves out the salt. And one of the reasons why they do that is salt delays gluten development. It's also the case that making bread dough takes more time anyway because you need time for fermentation, right? The yeast need time to puff up the dough. That takes hours and that's plenty of time for the power of enzymes and water to develop the gluten in that dough for you, basically knead it for you. And that initial delay that you get from the salt just doesn't matter as much in the end. Pasta dough, in contrast, has no yeast. It does not have to rise, so it's generally made a lot faster. You knead together the water and the flour, you let the dough rest for like 20 minutes, and then you get to rolling. In that faster timetable, you really do feel that delay in gluten development caused by salt. Furthermore, I found that as I rolled out these two experimental pasta doughs by hand, like they would have done it old school, the salted dough was a lot harder to roll. Both doughs were very extensible, meaning I could stretch them out without tearing them, but the salted dough was more elastic, meaning it snapped back on me after I rolled it out. I would get it thin and then it would bunch right back up on me again. I think this is due to the strengthening effect of the salt on gluten. I'm sure a rolling machine or an extruder in a factory would be able to handle this salty dough just fine, but for me, doing it by hand, that's as thin as I was able to get the salty noodles. Compare those to the noodles I rolled from a no-salt dough. Way thinner, which means they're going to dry faster for physical reasons, more surface area for evaporation, and they're going to dry faster for chemical reasons too, because salt slows drying, because it's hygroscopic. When we're talking about traditional, no egg, just salt and water, Italian pasta dough, there's really only one argument I can think to make for putting salt into the dough. And that is that salting the water instead is kind of wasteful. You end up losing a lot of salt down the drain when you pour the water out. But if you salted the pasta and not the water, you'd lose some salt down the drain anyway, because a bunch of the salt in the pasta would dissolve out into the water during cooking. The salinity of the water and the pasta will move toward equilibrium for as long as the pasta is in there. And hey, it's not like salt and salt water were particularly scarce resources in the coastal society where this style of noodles developed. So there you go. There's the evidence supporting my thesis that Italian pasta dough evolved to be saltless because saltless doughs are easier to make. And we haven't even talked about the corroding effect of salt on metal tools and machinery. Maybe that was a factor. Now, if I'm right, why did many styles of Asian noodles evolve to have at least some salt in the dough? 